Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Tom, an alcoholic, and just, just to verify what he said, I'm a member of the primary purpose group in Southern Pines, North Carolina, and that's where I belong. That's not, I don't just attend meetings there, that's where I belong. I'm a member, real member. I show up when there's work to do. I show up when we've got problems. I show up when we've got celebrating to do, which you guys really know how to do here. I swear to God, I think that's the most anniversaries. And newcomers I've ever seen welcome in the same meeting. That's just really, really impressive. And so to those of you celebrating some years, congratulations, and hope you'll have many, many more. To those of you who are, who are new and just getting started in the program, uh, you are, our thoughts and prayers will be with you and our fellowship will be with you as long as you let us, let us get hold of you. And, uh, so <laughs> sure hope you can get in. I, I just give you one little, little bit of a, <clears throat> Maybe a cautionary note, though, if you are new. If if I make it till uh, next Wednesday, that will be 52 years since my last drink. And, uh, <laughs> that's, 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 thank you very much. But now that's not the caution. Now it is a caution in a way. When I came in here, I was 24 years old, so you know I'm 63 years old. By any mathematician, <laughs> close. <laughs> and you, you, so you know, I was pretty young. I was 24, and uh, I swear to God, when I came in today, I thought I died. Everybody in there it looked like a wrinkle factory. It was running full production, and I'm the one little old wimp there in the corner. And <laughs> I think my greatest fear was that this thing might actually work. <laughs> so here I am, almost 52 years later. And so I, I just want to give you a little warning. If you do, you better get out while you can, because if you stay too long, we'll get you. <laughs> and you'll be here for the duration. <laughs> so I, I seriously do wish you well and, and um, welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, th- I didn't know what that meant when I first came in, but, but, but certainly I do now. Because I, and, and by the way, uh, that, that, the 19th of November is not when I celebrate my recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the date of my last drink. And you may not, if you're new, you may not know what I mean here just yet, but you will pretty soon. That not drinking is the starting point in AA. It's not the stopping point. It's the starting point. And, and, and not drinking, uh, is not what I celebrate. What I celebrate is the, the day I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, which was February the 2nd of 57. And that's what I celebrate, because that's where the new life began. And, and so I hope very much that, that your experience will be that when you get into this program, you'll find a brand new and different life, different anything I could have. I, I didn't, couldn't imagine that I would ever stay here. But I am deeply grateful that, uh, that I have. I've had all these years of pretty doggone fine living. Uh, I've, I've had an absolute ball in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I was extremely active when I first came in the program, and I'll let you know a little secret. I still am. <laughs> I'm as active as anybody I know and have been for as long as anybody I know. And we're not racing. That's just the way I'm geared. I wasn't the kind of guy that would sort of tiptoe down to the saloon and have a drinky poo. That... <laughs> That was not the way I did it. You know, if, if I drifted down there, you bet I wouldn't be back anytime soon. You know, because when I went, something's going to happen, and if it didn't happen pretty quick, I'm going to start something just to get it going. And so I, I was not somebody that, uh, well, anyway, the, the, uh, I was going somewhere with that, but I got lost in route. <laughs> That's the guy, that's the guy that came in here anyway. And, and to think that I've been able to have an absolutely enjoyable, thrilling, delightful, unbelievably rewarding life. I, I'll tell you what I was going to say to the punchline to that. Some people, 
and I warn you about them now, some people in AA will tell you that there's a fairly predictable cycle that you'll tend to go through. That you'll come in and then if it clicks and starts to work for you, you'll have a little shot of euphoria and start to really feel good and you have what we call a honeymoon period or the pink cloud period. And then at some point, that's supposed to taper off and level off into mediocrity or something. I, I'm not sure what it's supposed to level off at. Because I'm here to tell you from first-person experience that that pink cloud, that honeymoon, that exhilarating period will last as long as you do the things that make it happen. No more, no less. No more, no less. But that never has to end. I'm still as excited about Alcoholics Anonymous as I've ever been. I'm as enthused about it as I've ever been. I'm as involved. I'm as creative as I've ever been. And so that can last a long, long time if you, if you want. So that's the good news. And so now I'm going to quit talking about y'all and talk about me. <coughs> yeah. yeah, I was a guy, I think I was very much like most folks that come into AA. I was somebody that was uh, just, I was just kind of a screwed up young guy. I didn't like who I was, where I was, didn't like the people I was with, didn't like anything about my life. I just had a bunch of stuff happen called life that didn't agree with me very well, and I was always just kind of a miserable, twerpy kid. I'm not a bad-looking dude now. If you, uh, I mean, unless you get real close, you know, and put me under a magnifying glass, I, I can't stand much of that. But I don't look too bad compared to what I used to look like. Yeah, I was a guy, I was... I was just sort of a, a, a twerpy kind of a kid, got t- tall, skinny, and my ears, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but I have outstanding ears. I, I mean, <laughs> they are outstanding and upstanding. They, they, they're big is what they are. And, uh, and the, the, the ridiculous thing, these things have been this size my entire life. I mean, <laughs> Can you imagine a kid in third grade going to school with something like that? <laughs> if I'd get one of these skin down haircuts like that, mine would look like wings out there. <laughs> Kids used to call me Dumbo. <laughs> Not Gumbo, Dumbo. And uh, tell me I look like a taxi going down the street with both doors open. You know that? <laughs> Kids are sensitive, you know, and so. But that's what, what it was. And so I was just that kind of a, an awkward, clumsy feeling guy, you know, and, and just like a lot of kids are when they're coming along. And, you know, I'm no novelty in that. You know, you know, most folks go through this kind of awkward period. Some survive it, some don't. Some never get out of it. And, and so I was just one of those. And, and so I was somebody, started drinking as soon as I could, I, really. The uh, drinking wasn't a, a stranger in, in, the, in my family. I was born back, this does put me back, I was born during what they call the Great Depression. The more I learned about it, the less great it seems. But it, but it apparently was awful because I was born in the middle of it. And, and even before I learned that there were some people who had a lot, I knew we weren't hitting on much, and we were in pretty bad shape. And, and my, my grandfather had been a tobacco, or no, not tobacco, but a cotton farmer till cotton quit selling, and then he took up liquor making as a profession. And back then, that was a, that was a pretty polite industry down in my part of the world. And, uh, you know, we had police come there that they, they never did come to raid the place. They'd come as customers. And it was just kind of a, a, a routine, above board kind of a business. And I grew up in that kind of a culture. And, uh, early on, I was just kind of fascinated with that whole business of drinking. Started experimental drinking, you know, just sort of finishing up the dead soldiers on the table, stuff like that. And uh, I was just always kind of intrigued with it, fascinated with the whole deal. And and so I I always had it in my mind that that had sort of a special quality to me for some reason. And then when I when I turned 16, I was wanting out of Mayberry, to tell you the darn truth. I was flat wanting out of there. I'd had enough of that place. And I coerced my family, my mother primarily, into uh, lying about my age so I could get in the military. And so when I just turned 16, I started drinking like a fish and became a soldier in the U.S. Army. <laughs> you could have slept better back then. 
knowing I was on duty. <laughs> if you were drunk, you'd sleep better. <laughs> but I, I enlisted in the U.S. Army. No surge of patriotism. I just wanted to get away. He got in there and did fairly well. In fact, no, I did very well, really. Yeah, I mean, I was just a doofus eight-ball kid from nowhere in North Carolina. And I uh, went military, went through training. When they got through, they had a thousand of us lined up. And they always make speeches and play bands and walk you to death in 110-degree weather. And they, when they got through and they were noting the people worthy of mention in, in that thousand people who went through training, they named me as one of the five most outstanding guys in the outfit. <laughs> that still seems so ridiculous to me. <laughs> but did to them later, too. I got, uh, when they called my name, I said, huh? <laughs> People around me said, huh? <laughs> yes. Because that was the biggest blunder in the history of the federal government. And that takes in a lot of, a lot of territory. And they were going to send me off to leadership training, going to develop me into an officer and a leader of men. <laughs> right on. Now. <laughs> and then uh, about the time they selected me as being the hero of the year, uh, I found my way to town, and they found out what they had. And it was not what they had in mind for leadership material. So they uh, took logical action and, and, and stationed me up in... Alaska and the Aleutian Islands. <laughs> if you don't know where that is, keep it that way. Well, you know where Alaska is. You know, they, we, we, they produce vice presidents up there. They, <laughs> but, <laughs> well, no politics here. <laughs> I probably was the breeding ground for that kind of thing. But anyway, I, that's where I went. <laughs> and the Aleutian Islands was, uh, I never could figure out what I was doing there. I mean, nobody ever told me. They, they just put, they'd give me an assignment. All the Aleutian Islands, I was on a place called Adak. And all it is is a rock out in the Bering Sea that has no reason for existing whatsoever, except as a sitting place for a few walrus or seals or something. And I'm standing out there with a gun in freezing letter, a delicate flower of the South. And, <laughs> and here I'm up there standing there freezing to death with a gun. I'm supposed to shoot somebody. I didn't know what for. I didn't think anybody was going to steal the rock. If, if, they, if they wanted to steal it, I'd have helped them load it if they'd let me go with them. But anyway, that, that's where I was. And uh, by the way, no extra charge. I'm going to just slide this in here real quick. I, I was a, a couple years ago, I was up in Alaska speaking to a little conference up there. And uh, I just said to the crowd... Is anybody here that grew up on Adak, my island in the Aleutians? And a guy said, yeah, yeah, me. And I said, keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. I said, I want all y'all to look around and spot this bird and then stay away from him. Because <laughs> anybody grew up out, out there is nuttier than a fruitcake. And, <laughs> and we got into a little discourse today. After the meeting, he came over and we visited, and he said, Will you sponsor me? <laughs> I said, No, I won't sponsor you, man. I wasn't kidding. You gotta be an idiot. No, ain't no way. I sponsor you. And I finally conceded that he calls me once a month just to sort of see if he's speaking some kind of coherent English. And, uh, <laughs> and we have at it. <laughs> Isn't that strange, though? Yes, I got a great big box. Well, get off old stories. I'll never get mine. But I, I got a great old big box the other day from uh, that place where that lady was from. Uh, uh, whatever, right by Denali Park. What do you call it? Huh? A town where that lady was from. That. Yeah, that's it, Wasilla. Yeah, God knows I've been there. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I got a box mailed from Wasilla. The postage on it was sixty-seven dollars and something cents, and it was from my idiot friend from Ada, <laughs> and it was magnificent halibut and salmon that this guy sent me. Yeah, funny how we make bedfellows, eh? Funny how we come together. We just connected at a level of idiocy that 
It's just, just turned into a real good friendship. But anyway, that's where I was. And, and so I was not a happy camper out there, as you can gather. I, I, I changed that reality like every reality ever changed. I tried my best, stayed drunk every minute that I could, did a pretty good job of it. And somehow or other, in the midst of all of that, is where I developed alcoholism. Now, you've got your beliefs, I've got mine. You know, I believe alcoholism, I believe, is truly an illness. And I believe it is best defined. The best definition I've ever heard is in the third chapter of the book, in the, that first page on the third, the third chapter. About halfway down, there's two, two lines in there that have extremely important meaning to me. One is the, the definition, clearest definition I've ever heard, says we alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control their drinking. I believe that's fundamentally the best definition I've ever heard because it gets right to the heart of the matter. It has nothing to do with Wild West stories. It has had nothing to do with how many times I got married. I got married one time to a lady I didn't even know. I mean, I hadn't met her. I met her the next day. <laughs> <laughs> And I didn't mean to marry her, but it costs just the same. It doesn't make any difference whether you meant it or not. But even goofy stuff like that, that doesn't define alcoholism. You know, that's not alcoholism. That's just goofy, drunken behavior. You know, alcoholism, I'm a person who lost the ability to control his drinking. That's my entire story. Everything else is circumstantial thereof. We did a little survey, just to prove my point. We did a little survey years ago back in, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, our biggest city. And this was in 1960. You know, way back when we had real alcoholics back then. You, you remember that. This lady's 453 years sober from, she just moved up from Southern California. 53 years, right there. You got, stick your hand up. Right there, that's her. <laughs> All 53-year members are humble. <laughs> There's no recognition. But we did back then with those hairy-legged drunks. We had bad drunk back then. And we did a nose count out of the population of that city. How many had been in jail as much as one night? Well, I thought, my God, any self-respecting alcoholic has been at least once. I mean... <laughs> 30% had been in jail as much as one night. 70% had never been in one. I couldn't believe that. I thought, my God, where did they drink? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't drink in places like I did. They just locked up you up for being there. You didn't have to do anything. But anyway, that, uh, but going to jail is not. Now, I've been to jail more times than I care to remember. I like to think I've been exactly the right number of times, because <laughs> I ain't been since. So I hope it's the right number. It has been so far. But that's not, that's not done to fight alcohol. Yeah, I think sometimes we get so caught up in these Wild West stories about who can throw up the highest in the air without getting in your hair. You know, <laughs> uh, you know crazy stuff. You're married to the same woman five times, same year. Yeah. <laughs> Stayed blind, drunk, 30 years, you know, well, good God. Now, there's some base in reality there. Not much, but there's some base in that, maybe. That, uh, but we get into those Wild West stories as if that's alcoholism. And, and, and it's not. You're the heart and soul of alcoholism. I'm somebody who lost the ability to control their drinking. Yeah. I, I was talking to a guy in some, somewhere last week or two. Nice, nice man, nice yuppie type of man, real good, Mr. Clean. He was one of those who would have rated as never having gone to jail. And he was looking at me like he was looking at a cobra or something. You know, he, he, he was fascinated by me, but he didn't want to get too close, you know. And he, he was look, looking, and uh, he said, I could never do what you do. I said, what? He said, well, I couldn't get up and speak to people. I said, why not? You're drunk, aren't you? And he said, he, he said, yeah. I said, well, tell him about it. He said, oh, I couldn't do that. You know, I'm not funny. I don't have any real, real blood and gore in my story. I, I, nobody want to listen to me. And I tell him something. I, I, I told him something. And, and I hope if you're somebody that's more inclined toward the Mr. Clean category, 
for God's sake, don't apologize for it. The, uh, I told him what I honestly believe, that if he got up and told his story, ten times more people would identify with him than me. You know, a lot of time we hold back because we don't think we got that old rip-roaring, wild, crazy story. But my God, alcoholism is about dying on the inside. It's about the inability to function. It's about your life breaking down. It's about looking at yourself in the mirror and want to gag at what you see. It's about that exercise in futility of just debating whether you even want to live another day. That's alcoholism. It has nothing to do with captivity or cages or broken noses or being broke. Nothing to do with that. It's about a human being being broken. We alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control their drinking. And everything else is secondary. That's what happened to me at ADAC. Now, I was making a lot of noise, you know, and wrestling walruses and all that stuff. I was doing a lot of goofy stuff. But what I was really doing was losing the ability to function as a human. That's what was happening. You know, the rest of that stuff was just the background music. And, and so what happened to me in that period there is that I developed alcoholism. And while I didn't know it, my life was to never be the same. And, and I had no clue. I didn't realize when I developed alcoholism. It's a subtle process, eh? It, 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 and crossing that line, I wouldn't have noticed some minor nuance, nuance like uh, crossing a line because I was quite busy at the time, and I wouldn't have noticed little stuff like that. But, but looking back after I got sober, I could see that that's where my drinking changed. And the characteristic of alcoholism was if I took a drink, I could not predict what I would do how much I would drink, where I would drink, what I would do when I drank, how long I would drink. Predictably, I would drink till I either got captured, locked up, or just flat run out of booze and had nothing left. That's the only time I stopped. I never stopped because it was an alarming thought, like, my God, you've got to go to work. That did not occur to me. <laughs> and, and so that's what happened. When I was 18 years old, when that happened, and then from that time on, my life would have been predictable to anybody who understood that, you know, but, but not to me. You know, I'm living in that vain hope that deep, deep down, I had a few people tell me I had potential, that I had a lot of potential. I know I'm the only alcoholic that's ever heard that. But, but I heard it a lot. And you know what? They were right. They were right. I did have potential. But I was so busy tripping over my own feet, I could never get anywhere. And, 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 and so... That, uh, that my life was just 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 characterized from from that point on when I crossed that line that I just started to self destruct and and what was happening to me should have been obvious had I been an astute observer because my life became a seemingly endless series of just sort of crashing hitting the wall falling then trying to suck it up and start over. And what I failed to notice, what I failed to take, take, take notice of was that every time I hit the wall, failed, and started over, I settled for a little less and a little less and a little less until I wound up living a kind of life that I didn't even know existed. I mean, my, 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 that, 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 that raunchy place I grew up as a kid, it was bad news. But... <laughs> Nothing compared to what I, what, what my life became. And, and, and so once, once I started that, that downward spiral, you know, it happened, it was a noisy thing, but it was so subtle. It's like I, I read, a, I read a little thing one time that said the chains of habit go on so gently that we don't feel them until they're too strong to break. And that's exactly what that was. It's certainly a more raucous, noisy kind of a thing, but it was really that thing that, that loss of control. I, I tell you, a guy named Bill Wilson explained that a lot better than, than what I'm saying. Then, in, when the when the book was written, the the word denial is you'll never find it in the book for a good reason. It's not in there, and I don't think it was not was was, was not put in because the, the Bill didn't know the word. My God, he knew every word in every language. I believe that guy was a genius. And, uh, but I think it was not put in the book because it was not applicable to the condition. You know, the, the, my, my, in my view of denial 
is basically an intellectual battle with the encroaching things that are closing in on you, whatever they are. And it's just that sort of feudal battle of trying to push it away and pretend it's not true. It's an intellectual kind of a thing. What Bill talked about were two other terms that, that get at the same thing, but I think a lot more profoundly. He used the words delusion, delusion, not denial, delusion. An inability to differentiate the true from the false. How true. And he used the word illusion, an inability to see life as it is. And I say that just simply to frame what would otherwise be a very long story. You know, that, that what happened as I was deteriorating, my life is falling completely apart. I, I mean, a wino could have diagnosed me. I mean, you wouldn't need to have you know, letters behind your name to diagnose me. I mean, I was obvious, I think, to anybody who was observed. And while I'm crashing through, my life seemed normal. You know, there's a place in the book that says, our life seems the only normal one. And my God, how that could be normal is beyond me. But it did. You know, and I got to that point with that life of illusion and delusion that I would see people engaging in normal life and it looked strange to me. See people get a book, a, a, a lunch bucket and head to work early in the morning. They look bizarre. You know, it looked more normal for me to go to the bar, you know, or watch somebody taking their kids to school, you know, things like that. Those seem like another world to me, you know. And, and so that's what I was. I was just sort of racing through here, messing up everything I got close to. And and that's who I was. I, 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 once I got out of the military, I just sort of crashed on through life. I was like a social record ball. I, I didn't, I didn't do, it wasn't that I just did massive damage. I just screwed up everything I got close to. And, and if anybody got associated with me, they regretted it or should have. Anybody got associated with me got dirty, embarrassed, used, humiliated, taken advantage of, scared to death, name it. That was just the way I was. It, didn't, it wasn't overt actions. That's just the way I was. That was the, the effect I had on folks. And so I just crashed on through life after I got out. Drifted up to the state of Michigan. And uh, <clears throat> you got to be drunk to go there. He <laughs> drunker to stay. And I went up to a place called Flint. And Flint... <laughs> Roger Moore put Flint on the map for whatever it's worth. It, uh, one of the few sources of pride I had as a, as a young fellow coming along. Flint, one, two times, Flint was named the worst city in the United States in which to live. And when that happened, I felt a sense of pride. You know, I, <laughs> I, 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 I put that one up in the W column. You got to put Flint on the map. But that's some claim to fame. Yeah, but as that, as I, but I was, I was crashing down. That's where I was. And in that, in that environment, I wound up living a kind of life I didn't even know existed. Yeah, I was not, I'm not, I have never committed a predatory crime in my life. You know, that was intended to be some criminal kind of a thing or time. Uh, or even dishonest stuff. I didn't steal, steal, I mean, I might take something away from somebody. But where I lived in Flint, there were only two classes of citizens that lived in, in that part of Flint. It was either the rollee or the roller. And that's all it was. Those were the only two job classifications I ever saw that had any legal look to them. And uh, those were interchangeable roles. <laughs> Whoever was friskiest on a given night would do the drinking. The next night would be the other guy, you know. But I, mean, you know, I, I wound up living in that kind of junk, and I thought it was normal. It seemed normal. Because that's what I did. Lining up with other guys and selling my blood, five bucks a throw, seemed normal. Just how much you get with that, that sort, of, sort of bizarre delusion and illusion of alcohol. And the fact that I couldn't see that. Yeah, I couldn't see that. The countless times... Where I think that one little entry in the book that talks about pitiful incomprehensible demoralization, I think it was written for me. Because that, my life was an endless series of just coming to in bizarre circumstances and every time would be totally filled with words I didn't know that I later learned were pitiful incomprehensible demoralization. That was my life. That was the story of my life. 
And so it was obvious a guy like me was going to come to no good end, and, and certainly that was the case. I was, uh, I, I never was a, a mean spirited guy. You know, I mean, you'd, you'd have a hard time telling that by, by the behavior, but I really wasn't a, a mean spirited guy. And, but I knew that I was capable of doing a lot of stuff. One morning, like most people, and, and I, I guarantee you, if there's a group in the world that could identify with what I'm, what I'm getting ready to tell you, it's this group here. I don't think there's a single person in this room, whether you got the problem or you live with it or whatever, that couldn't identify. Uh, because I wound up doing the kind of thing that, that most alcoholics have feared doing. And thank God most don't. You know, most of us really don't want to hurt people. We often do, but, but it's most of the time not, is not malicious. It, it's just part of the, the, the way it works. And, uh, so I always knew I was capable of stuff and, but like most people, I never thought anything just truly drastic would happen. And one morning, I woke up in jail in Flint. There's no novelty there. That was routine stuff. And um, when I was awake for a little while, you know, the jailer had a routine. I knew it very well because we knew each other very well. And and uh, he had a routine. He would come by about 10 in the morning, and, um, and, and, and anybody that wanted to try to get out would go up and tell him that you wanted to try to make bond or whatever. And, and so I walked up to the bars and I said, hey, guy, when can I get out? And he said, I hope never, and walked off. I had no clue what he was talking about, no clue. But I knew he was serious. You know, he wasn't playing. I knew he was serious. I had, had no clue. And he didn't say anymore. I went back into the, to the tank, and some guys in there told me that I apparently had heard the news or read a paper or something. And, and, uh, and, and one of them told me, he said, uh, Said last night some guy was driving drunk down Main Street and uh, struck and killed two people. And he said they've arrested you for the crime. And that was the first I knew anything about it. And, and the, 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 the shock and disbelief was, was just just understandable. You know, when I heard that, I thought, no, that couldn't be true. And I just refused to believe it. You know, the mind's a funny thing; it'll only accept what it can handle. And that was more than I could handle. And, and so when I was greeted with that, I just said, no, that couldn't be. And I refused to believe it. And it gradually accepted the truth that, that I had done more damage than any drunk ever ought to be allowed to do. And my response, I guess, would be predictable. Just, just shock and amazement and grief and total. I, mean, I was ashamed to be breathing when two fine young folks no longer were because of me. I don't care how perverted you might get. You don't balance the scales on something like that. There's no way. <clears throat> it's the only time I'd ever been in jail I didn't try to get out. I didn't want to get out. I was afraid to get out. I was ashamed to get out. I was ashamed to be breathing, never mind get out of jail. I never let anybody know where I was. You know, I had family down in North Carolina, and and uh, I never told anybody. I, I'll never know why, nor try to find out, but one of the policemen there... I never have tried to find out who he was, but a policeman there, I guess, saw the shape I was in or something and learned that I had family in North Carolina and called my folks. And my mother and sister did what I guarantee you some family members sitting here have done when it made absolutely no sense. I ought to let him just drown in it. But no matter how logical, the family will always reach in until they get right past that breaking point. Always. And, and, and so they were no different. <clears throat> so my folks made a trip to Michigan from North Carolina they couldn't afford, got an attorney that they couldn't afford to get out of, a guy out of jail that didn't even want out of jail. But I didn't know how to tell anybody that. You know, how do you say to somebody, I want to stay in here? I, mean, that, that, I just was not able to even communicate like that. And so they got the attorney, he arranged, he arranged for my uh, release on bond. I was charged with manslaughter. And... Uh, I knew, I, I knew, I, I, even though I'd been booed, I'd, I was thrown out of the military, uh, ultimately was thrown out with an undesirable discharge for alcoholism when I was 20 years old. And uh, had absolutely zero impact on me. But but I'd been diagnosed as alcoholic by everybody who ever, who ever captured me. I, I'd never had any other diagnosis in my life. And uh, But I had never believed any of them, none. I didn't believe I was alcoholic. I thought I was really a world beater, and one of these days, man, if I can just stay on my feet, I'm going to get going. That's what I believe. Yeah. Right down the tube. And so, but it wasn't about alcoholism. When I, when I notified I was going to get out on bond, it was on the night, uh, the, you know, the 17th of July. 
17th of July, 56. And um, I knew I wouldn't drink. I mean, my God, how could you drink after having done something like, like I'd done? There's no way. Yeah. I just didn't understand. I, I didn't believe I had alcoholism. I, I certainly didn't know anything about it. And I was released. I, I didn't know what to do with myself. I was ashamed to be breathing, ashamed to see anybody. And I just walked the streets all day, all night, till about noon the next day. And then on the 18th of July, I started drinking like nobody I've ever seen. And that's not just some idle ballpark figure. I've worked with thousands of alcoholics, not a few. I've worked with thousands of alcoholics. I've never worked with one like me. Never have. You know, I held an alcoholic in my arms on a 12-step call way back. Died in my arms. And, and even as he was dying, he was protesting the condition. And I just gave in. I mean, I just gave in. It wasn't so much acknowledging. I just gave in to the condition and made no pretense to do anything. And, and so, so when I, when I got out, I made it till the 18th and I started drinking, of course. And, and, but from, from the 18th of July till the 19th of November, next Wednesday, uh, I drank literally, literally, like, like nobody I've seen. Uh, some folks say that alcoholism is a slow form of suicide. I think in my case it was not a slow form. It was an overt, uh, deliberate thing at suicide. I think the only reason I did just overtly commit suicide, I didn't want to leave a family with another burden to ponder. And if I just found dead of an OD or hit by a truck or something, it would be a, at least a question. I, I know that's, a, that's the only thing. And then the 19th of, of December, I was, uh, of November, I was to be tried. I went down to court, finished a bottle of gin, had about three inches in it, finished that bottle of gin, and, and went to court. Knew it was a one-way trip. I, I knew I wouldn't be back. I had no defense. No defense. It's a hell of blackouts, you know, that I'm not the only guy in this room who's had blackouts. You know, we're not talking about taking a nap. We're talking about the curtain dropping and their periods of life that are total blank. And I'm not the only guy who's had it. And if, and if you've had that, if somebody come up to you and say, do you know what you did on this date? And the best you could say is, geez, I wouldn't do that. And that's the best you could do. And, and, and so when, when I, they had me testify and all I could do was the, 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 the guy in a black house testimony. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know. And I didn't know. And then got through and I was found guilty. Of course, there was no, no surprise there. I, I, I knew that was coming and, and I really wasn't fighting it. I had no fight left. I was done. And uh, so I, I was found guilty, sentenced to a max of 15 years in the, in the Michigan State Penitentiary. And I, I, mean, I didn't know anything about penitentiary. I'd been in jail God knows how many times. But penitentiary was a different deal. And I'd never, I'd never even seen one to know what I was looking at. But I, I, I knew that if they had some of the guys that I hung out with on the street in there, it was not going to be Disneyland. I, I knew that. And so the next day, the 20th, 20th of November, I was, I was led into that place on the chain. Knew when I went in there that I would never come out alive. I, I knew if I ever came out of there, it would be toes up. Had absolutely no illusions about that. I'm 24 years old. They normally didn't keep 24-year-olds in maximum custody. But owing to my history, I, I, I gathered, owing to my history, that totally ir, ir, uh, unpredictable kind of a, a behavior pattern, uh, I think they thought if they ever saw daylight, I'd be gone. They normally didn't keep, uh, it was like attorneys could tell you this better than I can, but normally a crime like that, and for many alcoholics, the crimes that we commit are, are referred to as casual offenses. doesn't mean minor, but it's casual offense, meaning it's an outgrowth of the condition, that it's not predatory, deliberate action, that is something that happens as a result of, of that. And, and so normally they didn't, but in my case, uh, they, they decided to keep me in. And so I went in, resigned to my fate. And I'll tell you, if anybody had tried to tell me then, or, or even logically explain it now, uh, it'd, be, it'd be hard to believe that I was about as comatose almost as a guy could get. I, I was totally, I'd always been, a, deep down, I'd always been an isolated type of guy. I just hid it very well. But I'd always been an isolated type of guy. And, and, and in there, I just shut all the way down. I, I communicated with nobody. I got into no conversation. If somebody asked me a direct question, I would answer, and that was it. 
they had put me in a cell. Didn't know the people in either cell on, on either side of me, and, and uh, they wasn't didn't care. They just didn't exist. And, and so I mean, I was absolutely done with this thing called life. And then one day, it's an amazing thing that I've noticed that any time I've to studied something profound, in its essence, it's very simple. Most profound things are very simple. Einstein reduced atomic fission to what sounds like remedial math, you know, when he explains it. But you know, that what happened to me was uh, a guy interviewed me one day, one of the staff people there, interviewed me, did an intake deal with social history and that kind of stuff that I'd had dozens and dozens of. And uh, he asked his standard questions. I'm sure I told my standard lies. I mean, I didn't have to rehearse. It was just instinct. And and so we got through. Amazingly, he drew the same conclusion that everybody ever captured me had. And he said, a little bit different, he said, man, you've had a lot of trouble with booze. And I said, yeah. I mean, my God, that's obvious. And I had a record that thick, and it's all about drunk and. That's all I've ever had in there. And uh, so he said, you had a lot of trouble. And I said, yeah. And then he said, we have an AA group here at the institution, and I think you ought to go. I'd never heard of AA. Now, this was a long time ago, granted, and, and, and I'd never heard of detox either, you know, unless you want to count jail. And uh, <laughs> we had a lot of that. And I tell you, it's very effective detox, too, particularly if they go upside your head with a blackjack on the way into the cell. <laughs> Guarantee you it'll work. And... Uh, but I'd never heard of anything like that. And this guy said we have an A group. He might as well have said that we've got an angelic choir here or something. I, it didn't mean a thing to me. And uh, in the conversation, I left a few days later. I got a little note on on my bunk. It said you can go to your uh, go to your first meeting February second of fifty seven. You know, in, in that penitentiary, that was at that time that was the largest walled institution in the world. There were, were sixty three hundred guys plus locked up in there. And so everything was crowded, including the AA group. They had a max of 300. You had to have a chair open before you could come in. And so I guess they had a chair open and said, you can go. And so I, I walked in. I, I didn't want, I didn't particularly want to go to AA. I did not want to go. I was as apathetic as a guy could be. I was absolutely done with life. I mean, it's done. All I wanted to do was sit in my cell and do anything I could do to keep from thinking. That's all I want. And so this guy sent me that note, said you can go. And thank God I was beaten enough that I had no fight. I had no fight. The most beautiful language, beautiful word in the language of recovery for me is surrender. It's what it's about. It's not about attainment or achievement or learning or climbing those golden steps. That's, that's, that's not what it's about. It's about surrender. And giving up so that something new can come in. And that's exactly what happened. And I, so I walked, walk, wandered over there. It looked like a guy on Thorazine just went over exuberant about going to AA. And, and I walked in. And one guy spoke to me. I had an officer on the door. And he read my name. I was, I said, yes. And he said, sit down. Sat down and listened to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I, the way I'd lived, I thought I was pretty well shockproof. But I wasn't, because this guy, I mean, I'd figured this was going to be some kind of a religious fervor thing going on. Then. I'd had enough of that down in the Bible Belt. And I, I, the day I got old enough to not be drug into one of those places, I vowed I wouldn't go back anymore. And I didn't for a long, long time, long, long time. I was sober 11 years in AA before I ever went back to a church. So when I say I was shut down in that department, I'm talking down. I'm not talking about a little neurotic resistance. I'm talking shut down. <laughs> and uh, so I was dreading that. You know, when the first thing they did is pray. Did that serenity prayer. Not a big prayer, but it was big to me. And while they were praying, I'm thinking to myself, yep, just what I thought. Here we go. Be in here deep dunking for you. know what? <laughs> and I, so I, then they opened the meeting and they read a bunch of stuff like we did here tonight. We read a, they read a ton of stuff. They read everything but the phone book. And, uh, <laughs> and they uh, didn't introduce the speaker. And I listened to my first day speaker. 
And uh, I thought I was shockproof, but he did shock me. I, that guy stood up there and told his story. It had to be true. I mean, my God, nobody's going to make that up. I mean, that was the most God-awful story I'd ever heard. And I thought, why is he telling that? I mean, good God, he didn't look bad he like me. He didn't look bad if you if you don't get too close. But he was one beat-up dude. He, he'd been a professional boxer at one time. And apparently a pretty poor one. He, he, he was one chopped up boy. And, but, and he told that story. And, and I'm just sitting there absolutely amazed. Why would he do that? I mean, he's going to bear his soul to 300 hair-legged convicts in there. Made no sense to me. And I left. And when they finally quit, I, I don't know if they finished, they just quit. And, and when and they finally quit, I left. I was more confused than I was when I went in. I didn't, I didn't identify with one syllable of one word anybody uttered. But the next week I was back. Uh, next week I was back. And, and what brought me back, same thing brings a moth to the flame. It was the spirit that, that was generated, that spirit of enthusiasm, that experience of life, that there's something going on here. There's energy here. Now, I didn't think that through. I just found myself the next week sitting back there. Couldn't have explained it. Didn't need to. Did nobody care? There's 300 guys there. They're all worried about themselves. They're not worried about me, whether I come or didn't come, come back. And so I sat down. And uh, I'm deeply, deeply thankful that uh, you know, those of you who know me know that I am more than a little strongly inclined toward strong, purposeful groups of Alcoholics Anonymous as opposed to casual gatherings. But much, much. And it's owing to my heritage. The group I went into at that penitentiary, the recovery group is, is, is the name of it, was as, as fine an AA group as I've ever seen. It was an, and thank God for that. Thank God I didn't get some rinky dink little chat session that, you know, no. Yeah. <laughs> thank God I got hold of something that had form and substance and meaning and depth and purpose. Thank God I got hold of that. Thank God I got hold of a group that was a group of alcoholics in action, not conversation, but in action. And, and those guys, they, they introduced me to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we had some outside people who came in. If we could, if we could find them and invite them, we had outside I said, come in. We had to find them and get them. And uh, but the guys in the in the joint in the group introduced me to the program of AA. Had a little deal where they'd spin off some of the new guys, put them in a separate room, and then we'd introduce them. They, well, later on, I became one of them. But they would introduce these guys. What, hey, what is anonymity? What's, the, what's it about? What's sponsorship? What's the group? What are the steps? You know, that, all of that. And, and, and that, some of that had profound, I'll just give you one example that a guy one day said, pointed to the steps. He said, there are 200 words in those steps. And if you'll take the actions laid out in that as honestly as you're capable of doing, when you get through, you'll be a different cat. And it doesn't even matter what your motives are. And I thought, surely you jest, big guy. That <laughs> come on, yeah, but you got to be straight up and honest. No, you don't. Now, if you'll do those steps as honest as you know how, when you get through, your motives will be right. They'll be right. Those steps will make them right. And, and so, and I found that to be absolutely true. You know, there's some rumor that we used to do the steps and book and all that stuff a little bit more profoundly than we do now. If we did, they hid it from me very well because I never saw it done. I never saw anybody taken through the steps the first 15 years I was sober. I never saw anybody. I never went to a big book group the first 15 years I was sober. Good reason. There weren't any. There weren't any. And this notion that we were some sort of a deep-thinking think tank, not that I ever saw. Yeah, we were we were basically alcoholics in action. I, I used the big book a lot, but it was mostly to beat folk into the car so I could get hauled off from a bootlegger or something. That, but anyway, you know, I did exactly what those guys said, and I fumbled my way through those steps on my own with just the regular step discussions and some of the meetings we'd have, just a bunch of guys get together and just talk. Some of the best meetings I've ever been to in my life. And I went through those steps in a maximum custody penitentiary, and they worked for me as beautifully as they ever have since. I had an absolutely transforming experience. 
I became a free man. I became a free man. I knew that I could stay sober the rest of my life if I wanted to. And I was willing to take the actions that would make me do it. Became a free man. Not only from booze, but free to be myself and to engage in life. And started doing worthwhile stuff. I learned how to, for the first time in my life, experience dignity and honor and integrity. Those were words I didn't even know. And I learned to practice them as a way of life. And in one of the roughest penitentiaries on the planet, I not only survived and went through it mentally, physically, and spiritually better than I went in, I became a leader in that place. My God, man, I'm just some wimpy twerp here. But people respect you if you stand up for what you believe in. And you are what you say you are. And, and so I had a, a marvelous experience in there. That when... uh well, the time's never up. But when, <laughs> mine's almost up, though. When, uh, I, I'll just give you one little example about what a transforming experience it can be to be really caught up in the program. If there's a, a person on this planet that hates the penitentiary worse than me, I'd like to meet him or her. If there's anybody who hates one worse, I'd like to meet you because I hated every second that I was there. But this program made it possible for me to live above the slime. It made it possible for me to live with dignity and honor, and even in an environment like that. Every reward that can come in Alcoholics Anonymous came to me. Yeah. And so I had a, a great experience there and uh, was a tremendously active member. When I started to get released on parole, they had told me they'd let me go if I would go to North Carolina and not stay in Michigan. And... Uh, <laughs> I reluctantly agreed. And uh, <laughs> the night before, as much as I hated the penitentiary, the night before, just tell you what happened when you get caught up in AA, I found myself thinking, I need a couple more days. If I just had a couple more days, I could finish up some stuff. But I didn't tell anybody. I, I didn't tell a soul. Man, I, I didn't breathe it. I wouldn't have stayed one more second. I believe in rotation. <laughs> Particularly if he's going to keep me in jail, you know. <laughs> but no, I, I let her go, and then I hit the street. Your know, transition is an easy thing. We all face transition. Most of us do at some point. Yeah, you know, transition is a bear if you're not well prepared. If you're good and strong and solid in the program, it's a no-brainer. All you do is change home groups. You know? And that's what it was for me. That was a dramatic change, moving from a maximum custody penitentiary to freedom. But in essence, that's what it was. It was a no-brainer. Because all I was doing was just keep doing the same thing I'm doing and just doing it in a more pleasant environment. And so I went to work immediately. Day one, I went to work in this program because I knew it was my lifeline. I didn't need to join it. All I had to do was keep on doing it. And, and, uh, and it had just a, an absolutely great homecoming to a home I never did even like. I had to grow up to appreciate where I was born. Yeah. I had to grow up so I could accept it as my home. And so I, I dug in and started going to work. Second week I was out, I'm going to tell you just, just a few little things here, and then we'll, we'll go eat ice cream or something. The, uh, the, uh, right off, right off the bat, you know, the guys, when you move into a little old town, everybody knows you're there. And so, so people around the area knew, uh, knew that I was just getting out of prison. Some guys that, that I met said, come go to a prison with us. Second night, second week I'm out. And I said, are you kidding me? I've, <laughs> I'm not going to a prison. Man, they wouldn't let me in, and if I'd get in, they may not let me out. I'd forget that. I'm still on parole from a maximum custody institution. And uh, they said, oh, come on, man. They, they ain't nobody going to bother you. We know, we know what we're doing. And I finally said, all right, I'm going to go, but you better hope I get out of there because <laughs> it's going to be payday if I don't. And so I went. Two months after I was out, I was named outside sponsor uh, of that prison. Can you imagine uh, if, if you if if you can't understand uh, relate to this time and distance and time and place, you may you may miss this thing. But here I'm asked to be a leader, a trusted servant, to go in and help help operate a program for guys in a in a joint, you know, a little different kind of joint than I was in, but same thing. You lock up's the same no matter what you call it. 
And, and, and what an honor. What a tremendous honor. Uh, I could have been elected governor. It wouldn't have been more firm than I was with that. And, and, and so just went to work doing that. I was elected DCM five months after I was out. I'd, I'd finished two years, in, I'd not at Michigan State, but from Michigan State while I was locked up. So I'd learned to spell DCM, and I guess they figured that was okay for me to take it. And so I, I, I became DCM five months after I was out. And, uh, you know, a lot of good stuff happened. A lot of good stuff happened uh, along the way. I, I had absolutely wonderful experiences. Two years after I was out, I was sitting in my house one day and got a phone call from the, the state capitol. And it was a guy on the phone that I had met once. He, he came to the prison where I sponsored the A group. And I think somebody told him just to come by and give me a pat on the back or something uh, for whatever I was doing or to scold me or whatever. But anyway, he, it was him on the phone, and he identified, I, and I said, yes, sir, what is it? He said, uh, Mr. Ivest, <laughs> that we're expanding the rehabilitation program in our prison system. We were wondering if you might consider accepting a position. And uh, first thing I said, just instinctively, I said, do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> and he said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we've checked you out. And uh, the other thing that made that startling, as, as of the day of that phone call, there had never been an ex-con in the history of this planet hired into a professional position in a prison system. Nowhere on this planet. I knew that. And I knew they weren't going to start with me. But if they're going to start, they're going to start with somebody. And, uh, and so I told him, I said, man, I'd rather do that than anything I could imagine. And to myself, I said, there ain't no way. But I learned something. When God has work for us to do, let me say that one more time. When God has work for us to do, not when I want to do something, but when God has work for us to do, the walls come down. The walls come down. And I don't care what they are. As I was employed, you know, I'm not quite two years out of maximum custody. I'm still on parole from a maximum custody institution in my state negotiating with Michigan to release me from parole so I could be professionally employed in a system. Now go figure. Now I could understand if that was Oregon. But, <laughs> but my, my God, man, we're talking North Carolina. We're talking the state that elected Jesse Helms for a hundred years. <laughs> we are not exactly what you'd call a trendsetter state, you know. That's, uh, but I'm so proud of my state, not, not just because of me. Certainly that's a factor. But my state was bold enough to do something that had never been done in the history of the planet. Couldn't believe it. And I'll tell you something else I couldn't believe. From the first day of my career till the last day, not a single person ever discussed my history with me. Not a one. I fully expect them to say, do you realize what a chance we take with you, big boy? If you screw this up, you go screw it up for every inmate in the world. You know, I expected that. Not a word. They treated me like a professional employee. I acted like a professional employee. Wasn't ambitious, but I bothered to go back to college and finish my, my training in correctional administration. Did bother to do that, but not because I was ambitious, because when I went to work, I, I just gave it my best. Yeah, because that was more important to me than anything I could have ever imagined doing. And so I gave it my best. And an amazing thing happens when you do good work. People notice. And I started getting recruited over and over and over again. But people would see something I'd done and say, would you do this? Would you consider this? And I started getting up into supervision and management and, and directing some things. And, uh, and then one day, the... Uh, the head of our system asked me to come by his office that normally meant pinch hit for me somewhere. And I went in and said, yeah, boss, what is it? And he said, Tom, there's a, uh, I want you to take over an institution as warden. <laughs> now, even though I'm in the system, that is startling kind of invitation. Because I mean, it's one thing to be mud wrestling with the guys and designing program. That's one thing. But he asked me to be in charge of the Uzi. I mean, he basically, <laughs> and, and I, I said, boss, come on, man, I don't want to be the head of screw. <laughs> and uh, I said that. I, I laughed in the vernacular. And, 
And uh, he said, I don't want you to be. I tell me what you got in mind. He told me, he said, there's a kind of a correctional facility that I'd like to see in this state that doesn't exist anywhere that I've ever been able to find. And I said, well, what is it? He, he told me, he said, this is, this is generally what, what, what it'd like to look like. And uh, I mean, that's all it was, just sort of a pie in the sky statement. And uh, when he told me he, that he wanted to do something that had never been done, he knew he had me. And uh, I said, all right, I'll do it. And, and uh, I'll tell you something, that was the best training or management development I ever had in my entire career. Because that man did what any good leader ought to do. He, he picked a man that he thought could do the job, and then he gave him full authority to do it and full responsibility. And he picked the right guy. I did that. had a marvelous experience doing it. And, and so the long and short of it was that, that, that I had a, an absolutely unbelievable career. You know, I, I was one of the guys who, who opened the door for ex-cons to get hired. The hardest system in the country now that doesn't hire ex-cons in some capacity. It's a strange position when you when you are standing in, in in a place where man has never stood. Strange position, and I won't talk about them, but I'll just I'll just say this for whatever it's worth, in case we get to talk about it sometime later. AA traditions, AA traditions, were more help to me than anything I ever learned in my personal experience, my college my management development, more important than anything I ever learned because it's about how to make things work in unity. And for God's sakes, that's what life's about is how to get stuff to work in unity. So tremendously valuable to me. And so anyway, it's been, it's been one heck of a, a heck of a trip. I, I retired sometime back. I don't know when, but it's been a while. I know it wasn't this year, but it's been a little time anyway. I found out I was the oldest rat in that barn. And, and uh, shoot, man, I never wanted to be the oldest screw in the penitentiary. But I, and then I, so I, I finally retired. And I just, I, well, I, I'll close with just two thoughts here. One, the day I retired, AA folk get the word around real quick for an anonymous fellowship. I swear to God, we got a great <laughs> it, it won't quit. And so AA folk came to see me before I retired and said, Tom, we'd like for you to come do something for us in AA when you retire, and we know you're getting ready to do it. I said, what's that? I said, we need some leadership in our AA work in corrections, and uh, and we think you could help. And, uh, yeah, my thought was just very human thoughts. I said, come on, to myself. I said, come on, guys, give me a break. My God, I'm just finishing a 39-year high-pressure career. And uh, let me go sit in the mud, you know, or play golf or something. And uh, and then and I thought about it for a few seconds. You know, decisions don't take long. Indecisions are is a bear. Decisions are not that tough. And they asked me, and I thought about it real quick. And I, said, and I thought, there's no way I could say no. And I said, sure, I'll do it. And my wife was overjoyed when I told her that I had retired and had taken over what I told her was going to be a two-year commitment and in the AA corrections, she said, poopy. <laughs> or it sounded like that. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons that uh, that I'm an extremely active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I'm involved in every aspect of AA, whether it's CPC, PI, anything that has to do with active outreach, active outreach type programs. I'm in it up to my ears. And I wouldn't want it any other way. And, and so it, it keeps me busy, but it, it keeps me pretty well solidified in what I'm doing. I, I, and the last thought I want to just leave you, leave you, because I know some people in this room. I know there's some very active people in here. And when people get active in the program, there's always a certain amount of ambivalence about how much is too much and why, how do I get this precarious thing called balance and all of that stuff. What I've found... And, and, and I'll tell you just what I said in the beginning. I've been as active in AA as anybody I know for as long as anybody I know. And if there is anything in my life that has been less than richly blessed, I don't know what it is. A professional career where I finished at the top of a profession and never asked for a job. You finished at the top of a profession. 
a marriage. My wife and I just celebrated 40 years of continuous marriage. That girl's getting old. <laughs> Two kids that both, well, they aren't kids anymore, that uh, they both finished the university system. They're both doing extremely well in the profession. My daughter's in psychology, and my son's a, uh, he's a specialist in maternal fetal medicine. And uh, I, I had hope for that boy. I, th I thought he was going to be a good AA member there for a while. But I, I something happened on the way to the meeting, and he wound up going to medical school still. <laughs> and so that's what I'm talking about. I, I'm not just talking about everything's wonderful because everything's going my way. You know, we're just like any other family. But these principles, if I practice these principles in what I do, it will not compete. It will not run against. If I'm genuinely practicing principles, it won't collide with anything I do. And so I'm a guy, you're looking at a guy that I honestly believe is the most fortunate guy on the face of this earth. I truly believe that. Hope you do too. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.